Today we have the opportunity to have this uh, on the record discussion with uh, Dr. Arif Ali uh, Nayed, who is currently the chairman of Kalam Research and Media and also the chairman of the Libya Institute for Advanced uh, Studies. He's also former uh, ambassador of Libya, of Libya to the UAE. Uh, as, as you all know, of course, in post-Gaddafi Libya has seen a very uh, turbulent, uh, turbulent times, and for the past four years, uh, increased uh, political fragmentation and, uh, and insecurity have really uh, gave rise to a deep. Uh, deep crisis. Today we have the opportunity to have this conversation to discuss uh, the uh, options for a political uh, settlement. Uh, we, we, we'll do this in the following uh, manner. We'll first hear from uh, Dr. Uh, Nayad for about 15-20 minutes and then we'll have time for a discussion with all of you uh, in the room. Before, but now it's time for you to, to address the Thank floor. you very much. Rahman uh, Thank you very much Virginia for uh, this introduction. And I uh, thank uh, your colleagues at uh, this uh, esteemed institution for your kind invitation and for uh, arranging this on uh, such short notice. Uh, your hospitality is, is much appreciated. I also thank uh, all of you, ladies and gentlemen, for attending. And before I uh, forget, uh, I wish you all a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Uh, thank you for coming on a Friday afternoon in the holiday season. So uh, it's very kind of you uh, to attend. Um, I will try to be as brief as I can in, in my introductory notes because I would re really like this to be a discussion. And I, I thank all of you for attending and uh, those of you who are from the press, uh, feel free to, to quote me so long as the quotation is, is accurate as, and is in context. This is on the record and, uh, and uh, I, I very much welcome uh, any, any uh, questions that you, you may have. So I'll try to get to the questions as quickly as I can because I'm very eager to hear from you and not just to, to uh, talk to you. Uh, let me very briefly say that uh, I, I, I never intended to be a politician. I was uh, an academic, a theologian, a philosopher, and, uh, and a businessman because of family considerations. Um, and I, I got involved in the Libyan revolution very early on, from uh, about the second day of it. And uh, it's a long story, which I will not bother with, but uh, I was there in the initial anguish and the and the aspirations and the enthusiasm that were combined in the in the Libyan revolution, and we had high hopes for the uh, for the country, uh, hopes of a dignified life uh, under rule of law and uh, uh, with with the mutual respect and and uh, respect for human rights for women and men of Libya uh, and opportunities for our young people. And unfortunately, as a, as a participant in that revolution, I, 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 there isn't a day that passes where I'm not feeling quite, uh, I wouldn't say guilty, but quite uh, upset and, and, uh, and uh, disappointed at uh, the state in which we have uh, now reached or the state that we, we are living uh, in. The Libyan people and their suffering has increased rather than decreased. Uh, the numbers of uh, people who have been killed or maim uh, maimed or injured is vast. Uh, it's in the uh, tens of thousands. Uh, the uh, level of poverty has increased. The basic services have collapsed, and uh, the misery of the of the of the common uh, Libyan uh, folk is is actually uh, quite uh, increased over the last eight years. Um, which has led many people to look with nostalgia upon the period before the revolution uh, to the point where some people are saying that we should, we should have never had the revolution and some people are saying if we can only have Gaddafi back and maybe if we can't have him back, maybe we can have his son back. So there is a, I think there are lots of deep regrets. I personally feel these regrets and uh, part of my motivation for declaring my candidacy for the presidential uh, um, uh, elections, if they ever happen, uh, is precisely the feeling that if you break something, you kind of own it and you, you need to try and help to rectify the situation. There's been a lot of breakage in Libya. We've had basically a civil war, uh, a, a multifaceted uh, civil war that has uh, been quite costly. Now we are trying to get out of this situation and uh, the most agreed upon basis for getting out of the situation is what's called the Libyan political agreement that was signed in Skhirat. 
And uh, there is a uh, what the religious people call a mantra, which is uh, that everybody now uh, repeats, and which I will begin by repeating, which is that we all support the process of uh, the uh, Anzmil and the Skhirat Accord, and we all support the LPA, and we support uh, Mr. Ghassan Salama and his endeavor to reach a political settlement between the parties in Libya. There is no military solution to the Libyan crisis, and so I, I will... Uh, agree with all this, and uh, I, I will tell you that we have worked very hard at the Libya Institute for Advanced Studies to help the uh, the process and to help the LPA be implemented, to help uh, the UN and Ghassan Salama. We helped Kobler before him and, and uh, all his predecessors. I had the honor of bringing the first uh, UN envoy into Libya when I was the head of the Libya uh, stabilization team, and we have continued to work with every single one uh, ever since. However, I must say that um, there have been some major disappointments uh, recently, and I would uh, try to summarize them by saying that the LPA, even though we celebrate it and we want it, has never really been implemented. The LPA uh, foresees a collective uh, decision-making mechanism uh, in a council of nine people, and right now we have a de facto single-man rule uh, by the head of the presidential council uh, who has never been elected. He was not on the list of the parliament, and he was not on the list of the GNC, but was handpicked by the United Nations. Uh, and his rule was supposed to be for, with his colleagues, was supposed to be for a year, and uh, with a provision for a renewal of a second year. He has just finished his third year, and now we're going into his fourth year. So the LPA's many provisions, especially there is a huge section which is called the building uh, of trust measures, were never implemented. The release of prisoners has not been implemented. The return of uh, deportees and displaced people has not been implemented. The empowerment of women has not been implemented. The Women Empowerment Unit is actually run in a very uh, cliquish way that has not really led to any real empowerment. Uh, youth has not been empowered. Economic equity is not there. Uh, none of the provisions of the LPA have been implemented. So. Um, Many people, when they want to object to what's happening, they, they go against the Sekhirat Accord. I do the opposite. I, 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 I believe in the Sekhirat Accord. I think it was a great document. But the problem is it's never been implemented. The second group of concerns is the uh, breaking of promises. Uh, Mr. Ghassan Salama, who's a dear friend, and I have tremendous respect for him as an academic and as a friend, came in uh, with a very clear map. He said, uh, we are going to have a process. This process will have certain dimensions. Most importantly, we're going to try and renegotiate the LPA, and we're going to do a general conference, and we're going to have elections by the end of the year. And I took him at his word, and I believed him. So I declared my candidacy because thinking that we're going to have an election, even before the election was clear. It's like uh, bringing your uh, a car to a car race uh, where the ring hasn't been built and, and where the uh, rules of the race have not been declared. But I felt that I must do it in order to make the point that we need elections. So I was hoping that this declaration will lead others to declare and then that maybe if we have enough candidates, then we're going to have to have an election. Um, the year has passed. And uh, despite the uh, conference in Paris, uh, which actually set deadlines, a uh, deadline for uh, having a constitutional framework uh, in October, and then uh, uh, December elections, 10th of December was the date. That date has come and, and gone, and uh, there has not been a delivery of elections. On the contrary, there was a huge amount of work put into sabotaging the results of the Paris Accord, and our Italian colleagues, God bless them, made sure that uh, they, they elongated the process, and, and uh, the, if Palermo had no tangible results except one, which is the prolongation of our agony to the spring of 2019. So we're now promised elections in 2019, spring. Spring is springy, and it's a little bit, uh, you know, but it does have a technical definition. So we're assured of, of something before August. Because I think I think that's <laughs> okay. I, I, because the Italians would, will go to their summer holidays in August, so I'm sure that they will consider uh, the elections prior to. Um, so uh, that's all that was accomplished in Palermo. Palermo also clearly uh, showed that there is divisiveness, that there was no coherence. People were coming and going. Some people 
attended but did not attend, and some people refused to attend, and then they said yes, and then they refused again, and some people came but walked out. It was a mess, and uh, but it did succeed in doing one thing, which is to sabotage the results of the French effort. Uh, I think this nonsense of having a French effort countered by an Italian effort is, is not going to lead us anywhere. Uh, I think we should all uh, be sensible and agree to a way forward. I personally believe, and this, uh, I hope this is taken in the right way, that the situation is so dreadful and, and disastrous from a humanitarian point of view. I do not see the Libyan people uh, bearing this anymore or having the patience beyond the summer of 2019. The South is already very angry. They actually have a movement which is called the Anger of Fazan. And uh, they have just shut, out, uh, shut down the, uh, the oil supply from the, uh, from the South. The East is very angry, and uh, the West is very angry. Everybody is very angry. The only people who are not angry are the clique who are ruling us today, and who, despite all their differences, Eastern and Western and Southerners, unite in uh, what can be called the status quo party, which is united in the extraction of benefits from the wealth of Libya, and uh, are united in the prolongation of this status quo as much as, as possible. Um, contrary to appearances, the situation is actually quite ideal for people who are benefiting from it. And I believe that if we don't get beyond this impasse, I think there will be another revolt by the Libyan people. I, I foresee a, a, a rather uh, destabilized Libya if, if we don't have uh, the, the, uh, the discipline and the, and the courage to give the Libyan people back their votes and, and to give them the right to choose uh, who, who governs the country and who manages the affairs uh, of the country. Um, so is there a way out? Yes, there is a way out. What is the way out? Implement the LPA. Okay. Implement the LPA to the, to the letter and prepare for elections as soon as possible. And if the HOR or the House of Representatives and the State Council are going to use the powers invested in them in order to sabotage elections, I believe elections should be imposed under Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter. The, that chapter was used to interfere in Libya, to break the, the, the previous state and the, the previous regime. I do not see why it cannot be used to reinstate legitimacy in Libya uh, under, under a general election. Um, the notion that uh, we have a security crisis and because of that we cannot have elections is nonsense. The security crisis today is much better than 2014. And I think we, are, we can have elections even under the existing security situation. And we can even have even a better situation if the United Nations um, uh, puts a structure of a pan-Libyan force from all over Libya under a joint command by, say, seven officers from across the country uh, who can be picked through the, uh, the process of unifying the Libyan army, uh, which is happening in Egypt, with some foreign advisors being uh, part of the monitoring mechanism. There is no need for boots on the ground by any foreign troops. I think Libyan troops can, can, uh, can secure the election, provided there is joint command and some monitoring and, and vetting mechanism. Uh, so, such that the force would only include soldiers who are professional soldier, soldiers with proper military numbers. So I think there are solutions. So when people say, but the conditions are not there for the election, it's very important that they tell us why and how we can rectify those conditions. To use this excuse to prolong the status quo is to basically legitimize a period of prolonged uh, thievery, uh, corruption, and oppression of the Libyan people and deprivation of the Libyan people who are suffering from not receiving even basic services. Um, these are the opening remarks. I will stop here. I think it would be much more productive to address specific questions. Um, am I optimistic? One of uh, your colleagues have asked, asked me just when we entered that. Yes, I am optimistic because it's a human duty to be optimistic. I believe that uh, faith and, uh, and uh, charity and hope are, are fundamental to human existence. And I think we will make it and Libya will be a better place um, however, I think we, we need everyone's help. And, and the most important help we need is respecting the will of the Libyan people and, and giving the Libyan people the right that they revolted uh, uh, for and that they suffered for and that they sacrificed for, the right to choose their own leadership. Thank you very much for uh, your attention, and I now open it to you.
agree with the question. Thank, thank you very much. If I may uh, ask you the first question, I like that in spite of your rather bleak description of the situation, you still retain some optimism. Yeah. Can I ask about the uh, issue of reconstruction? Uh, how do you see prospect for reconstruction in Libya? Is this something that Libya itself would be leading on? Do you see international partners being involved in it? And if so, who? Okay, uh, first of all, I, I believe that reconstruction is, uh, is not only feasible in Libya, but is, is something that, that can happen rather quickly because of the resources that yeah. Libya does have, even with its frozen assets and even with the debilitating uh, thievery that has been happening. There are enough resources and enough reserves to, to be able to do this. I think for it to happen, we need uh, five things. First of all, we need a, uh, a mechanism for, for governance and transparency. That is, uh, that's an absolute necessity. The corruption is rampant in Libya, not just in the West, not in the East only, but in the South also. Uh, corruption is everywhere. Unless we have proper governance and transparency and uh, public tendering processes that are clear and, and out there on the, on the cloud that everyone can see, nothing's going to happen. Okay. Second thing that we need is, is some sort of a, a, of a portfolio management uh, regime, uh, uh, um, project management regimes, some sort of a, a PMO for, for this reconstruction that will be uh, centralized, not in the sense of controlling everything, but everything has to be uh, properly monitored and, and uh, vetted and, and compared to benchmarks and, and, and performance and deliverables have to be measured. Such a mechanism can be done under what's called the Economic Development Board, which was, has the requisite laws and can be part of the future Prime Minister's office, as it already is technically from a, a legal point of view. It just has to be done competently and not uh, only rely on Libyan expertise, but hire some expertise to help us with, with a, a PMO function to, to monitor such reconstruction. The third thing that we need is to uh, uh, do a, a serious decentralization in the, in the assessment of needs, the decision on what projects are needed, and the, and the uh, uh, implementation and the, and the monitoring of these projects. I believe that the municipalities should be a vital uh, part of this reconstruction effort, and there has to be um, decentralization in the, in, the, in the assessment of needs and implementation, but centralization in the monitoring and the quality assurance to make sure that deliverables are delivered and on time and, and, and uh, according to, to budget. Uh, much of the turmoil in Libya and even the civil war has to uh, precisely do with the lack of fair distribution of the country's revenues and, and the feeling of injustice uh, that, that is uh, quite serious in, in various uh, areas of the country. The South, for example, when, when kids die because of a, a scorpion uh, attack, and there is no uh, antidote at the hospital uh, when people die because of the lack of cancer medicine or because of the lack of uh, surgical uh, uh, basics. You know, this is this is not this is not right, and that's why people are angry. So, decentralization is extremely important, but at the same time, uh, we, we do have to have some sort of a, a unified uh, vision and some sort of a, a follow-up mechanism to make sure that there is fairness and, and fair distribution of everything. The uh, fourth thing uh, that, that we need for reconstruction uh, are, are, uh, uh, is a serious uh, look at the structure of the Libyan economy. In, in the old days of political economy, be it Ricardo or, uh, or Adam Smith or Marx, uh, there was this notion that an economy consisted, uh, consisted of, of three dimensions, land, uh, capital, and labor. Uh, the Gaddafi regime um, managed to manipulate all three and has been quite corrosive of all three dimensions. Land, uh, the land registry was burned. Capital, <clears throat> capital was confiscated and nationalized in 1978 and 79. And labor, the labor unions were made into revolutionary uh, uh, entities. Um, unless we restore the, the sanity to the fundamentals of the Libyan economy, this, nothing will happen. Unfortunately, since the demise of Gaddafi and the end of uh, the, the revolution, there has been no work on the fundamentals of the Libyan economy. As a matter of fact, people have found it very convenient to perpetuate the structures that Gaddafi has installed because a centralized central bank is very convenient who, for, for those who control the governor. A centralized NOC is very convenient for those who control the NOC. 
uh, centralized everything is very convenient for the ones who have the levers for that centrality. These things have to be completely revamped and re 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 restructured. The fifth thing we need is to convince people to invest in Libya. And to convince people to invest in Libya, I think there is a very old principle that my father has taught me, God bless his memory, which is do not expect people to invest in you or with you if you're not investing yourself. Mm -hmm. And if Libya does not invest in Libya, we should not be expecting people to invest in Libya. Libya has vast investments in Africa. We have hotels, we have uh, telco licenses, we have all sorts of things all over the place. Even in London, we have, we have investments, but we don't invest in Libya. This, this has to, to change. And we need to uh, build up the confidence for foreign investors by having a proper legal framework, by having uh, proper uh, processes and procedures, fair processes. People, people want to see clarity, they want to see transparency, and they want to have guarantees that they're not going to get confiscated or that they will not be able to, to uh, uh, repatriate their money and, and so forth. So I think if we have these five uh, uh, um, dimensions covered, we should be able to reconstruct Libya in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that can leapfrog over all our neighbors and our region. I believe there is no reason for Libya not to be the best country in the region if we actually uh, reconstruct it in the manner that I have uh, outlined. Thank you very much. Just a little small uh, follow-up. You know, we are talking about the reconstruction of the illicit economy, but there is also a very large illicit economy yeah. uh, around human trafficking and beyond. Yeah. How do you suggest that is addressed? Uh, <clears throat> Libya, like many other countries in, in, uh, in, uh, in our world, uh, has, a, has a, it's like an iceberg. The, the, the size of the economy that is not clear is much bigger than the, the tip of the iceberg. And um, I believe that uh, the work of De Soto, the South, South American economist, is extremely important on the importance of documenting informal economies. And, uh, for example, I believe that the transactions of real estate in Libya, which are quite opaque, we don't know who, who owns things because people have been contracting uh, just by, by uh, doing simple contracts with a with a, what we call Muharr al-Uqud, or a notary public. But uh, the registration for, for such transactions has been closed for a long time. I believe that we will need to bring that opaqueness, that darkness, into the light. And uh, we, we, should, we, should, uh, we have to document uh, such real estate transactions and the use of technologies such as blockchain now, and, and uh, we, we can actually create and also using satellite uh, geographic systems for mapping and for tagging these properties and so on. I think we need to work very hard to make that which is under the surface quite apparent. Only if you have a proper land registry will you be able to have collateral for loans which are necessary for starting small and middle-sized middle, middle, uh, middle -sized businesses. Uh, also, um, there has been a lot of uh, transaction in currency. Much of the Libyan dinar is nowhere to be found. We don't know who's storing it where. Uh, we need to, to study measures of how to make sure our dinars are clear. Uh, some dinars have been printed in Russia recently. There are dinars that have disappeared. We, we don't know. They're not in circulation. Mm -hmm. So do we have to change the currency? Do we, like these, these questions need to be addressed. We, our dinars and, and our currency supply has to be clear. Our gold reserves have to be clear and certified, recertified. Our lands have to be certified. So the more clarity we have, the more sunshine we have, the less likely we're going to have uh, weird creatures lurking underneath the rocks. So uh, you are right to point that out. As for human trafficking and, uh, and uh, smuggling and so on, uh, part of the solution is to lift the uh, subsidies, which make no sense. We're, we're now currently buying gasoline, and, uh, and it's being smuggled back to Malta and to Tunis and to Chad and to all sorts of places. So I believe that uh, we, we should be implementing a basic national income for all Libyans. And the portion allotted to Libyans for the support of gasoline, for example, should be given to them on smart cards and not uh, in direct su uh, in, uh, subsidies on the, on the product itself. Mm -hmm. Everything should be sold at its right price. That will immediately stop the smuggling of fuel, which is actually fueling yeah. a whole bunch of other types of smuggling. Yeah. As for the human trafficking and human migration, I believe that uh, this is a complex issue that has to be worked <coughs> on in partnership with the Europeans. This is not a, a problem that, that's uniquely Libya, Libyan. I think the current uh, solution uh, that the Sarraj government is implementing and which Mr. Salvini is very happy about is very bad for Libya. 
It's basically the, the Italian solution right now is to block the African immigrants from going to Italy by catching them in Libyan waters so that they are the responsibility of the Libyan state. So we have about a million people now. And Mr. Salvini is very happy about that. But what does that do to Libya? And what does that more importantly do to these uh, human beings who are being uh, held in holding facilities that are not worthy of animals, let, let alone humans? Uh, the, the slavery that's happening, the killings that are happening, the, rape, the rapes that are happening are on the conscience of, of, of not only Libya, but also of, of Europe. This is not right and must be stopped. How do you stop it? This is not something that we can solve on our own. We, we will need to convene a, a, a regional meetings on this. And I, I believe that uh, one of the keys to solving this is making sure that the differential is not so large. People are leaving their homes not because they like Europe, it's because they're dying. And they're dying because of global warming that, they, that they're not causing. And they're dying because of economic de development that they're being deprived of, which is not their fault. So what can we do to make sure that people stay in their place? And what can Libya do in terms of agricultural projects, for example, in the south that can actually offer jobs to our African neighbors and so on so that we can benefit and they can benefit, you know? So we need more sensible solutions. The idea of blockage and just keeping them incarcerated in holding uh, facilities in Libya is, I think, a, a moral wrong and is wrong for Libya and is wrong for Italy also. Yeah. So, thank you very much. And uh, last year, actually, we hosted an event here at AAAS where we showed this uh, documentary. Uh, it's a docu film, rather, based on uh, on the ground interviews in some of these detention centers. And uh, everyone was really speechless. And, and the, the stories that were portrayed were really, really uh, terrible and subhuman conditions. Yeah. So absolutely. Uh, I'll stop being selfish and I'll allow people to, uh, to chip in. Uh, Please wait for me to call on you, and if, when you ask your question, if you could please also introduce yourself, sir, please. Sami Zaktia, editor Libya Arab. Thank you, Dr. Knight. It was a nice presentation. But I think, if I may say, if we can get back to the building blocks, and uh, you sound as if you want to create a state, you sound as if you want to work with a state, call it hybrid state, all the new definitions of state, but to me you sounded to very much go on to work to the status system. I believe for a state to function, it has to have control, it has to have an army, it has to have police, uh, it has to be able to control its borders. The basic Weberian uh, definitions of a state, if I may be classical rather than modernist, what do we do with the militias? You know, we've jumped ahead of what we're talking about investments, we're talking about this, that. We could go back to the building blocks, and I think this is where our problem is, if I may, may suggest. We haven't got past, uh, you know, step one. You know, we, we inherited the militias, we worked with the militias. Okay, the weak NTC initially needed the militias, uh, but uh, they, they've enshrined themselves. Every successive prime minister has enshrined them, worked with them, and some would say they control them, definitely in Tripoli. What are the carrots, what are the new carrots, new sticks, that you, I may see in your manifesto that will solve this, this big problem? You know, whatever type of state you want, decentralized, three regions with very loose kind of regional, strong regional governments. We haven't got past step one, and nobody till today has been able to do this new security arrangement that for Siraj and, and your good friend Salam are so happy about. It's cosmetic, you know, if I may say so. They're doing nothing. Yes, the jury has given up a couple of sites here and there, but the militias are still there. And really, until you convince me as a voter, that you're going to be able to do something about the militias, you or any other <laughs> candidate, you know, we're still going around in the same circle. It's like the, 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 the vote of no confidence in Mrs. May. You know, it's a, the basic problem is still there. We haven't got back beyond the backstop. We haven't got beyond our militias. Well, what ideas do you have for that, please, if I may, here? Uh, of course. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for coming, Sami. I'm, I'm really happy to meet you finally. I have been reading your uh, amazingly important uh, publication and uh, have the utmost respect for your work, and thank you for that. Now, regarding the militias, um, it's, it's basically a, a monster, but it's a monster that has a, a wire, and that wire uh, is plugged into an electrical outlet. That electrical outlet is called the Central Bank of Libya. Libya has the unique uh, feature of paying its own killers to kill it. 
And I think the uh, first thing we need to do is to stop the nonsense of paying uh, salaries to the very people who are uh, killing us and, 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 uh, and kidnapping us and, and who are destroying the country. The practice of paying militias uh, that was started in the NTC and to which I objected uh, fiercely when I was uh, the head of the Libya stabilization team um, and that turned young people into mercenaries, basically, um, it has to stop. The control on the Central Bank of Libya is an absolutely important issue. The current monopoly of a small clique of, of people, okay, uh, who, who totally control the Central Bank and who control the trade finance, the letters of credit, and who control the, the currency, has to stop. And unless the Central Bank of Libya is taken out of the clutches of these people, nothing will happen. That is why when the NOC uh, retook the uh, control of the oil flow uh, under tremendous international pressure on, on the army, and the army obliged and gave the control to Mr. Sanallah and his NOC, uh, there was a simultaneous promise that the Central Bank of Libya will be audited and will be brought under some sort of oversight. That has not happened. First, there was the excuse that we don't want to interfere with Libyan sovereignty, and this has to be requested by the Libyan government. Then Mr. Sarraj wrote the letter and sent it. And then they said, oh, great, thank you for the letter. But the framework is not really that clear, and we need to clarify the framework. So we have to do an exercise to, uh, to identify the framework that we're going to use. And then that, to some extent, happened. And then they said now, the, the latest thing is like, now we have to identify some auditing companies that will come and do the audit. What I'm trying to say is, so long as the central bank is in the, is in the hands of thugs, who support thugs, nothing is going to happen. Okay? So this is uh, my solution to the, to the monster is to unplug the, the, the monster in the first place. Secondly, if you actually look at the numbers of these people, and there has been mapping of these militias, we're not dealing with very large numbers. And yes, you look at the numbers of people who take salaries, they're very large, but the real fighting force, if you analyze who's actually doing the fighting, it's no more than 200 here, 300 here, 150 there, I believe a, a pan-Libyan force of 5,000 plus a mobile uh, rapid deployment force of 500 special operations uh, uh, soldiers with proper command with a small air cover of no more than six aircraft is more than enough to hammer any militia that will dare to raise its head in, against the state. Nobody has dared to do this, and the reason is because the, uh, it's because the uh, so-called security arrangements that were supposed to happen under the Sekhirat Accord are a total sham. Unfortunately, the Italian general who was uh, the head of the, of the UN uh, team uh, basically cut a deal with the Tripoli militias in order to protect Italian interests uh, in, in, uh, in Tripoli and in the gas industry and, and uh, the interests of some of the clique that control Tripoli. This is not proper. This is a corrupt praxis that was given United Nations legitimacy. This is wrong. And this wrong continues. To actually give the interior ministry to someone who has uh, huge grievances against him, from the victims of Gharghur, the victims of Bani Walid, the victims of Urshafana, the, the victims of, of, uh, of uh, Garabulli, is wrong. For the UN to bless the new installments of the ministers of Sarraj within two hours of their naming is wrong. And this is not going to solve anything. So what I would do about the militias, cut off the money and build a credible pan-Libyan force under proper professional command, tell them to surrender or die. And that's what I would do with the militias. Thank you. You want to ask a question? Hey. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. Okay. okay, I'm back. I'm going to talk about the conflict that we have um, just uh, two questions for you. Uh, the first one is about the Cairo talks. Uh, there has been considerable opposition in Misrata about any uh, leadership role for General Khalifa uh, Do you think that this could be, um, that there is any solution to that? And the second question is about the interference of foreign powers in, in the, on this issue. Uh, we have seen that. Um, uh, foreign powers and international organizations are willing to offer assistance to, to, to the rebuilding of the Libyan uh, security forces and military. NATO has offered assistance, 
Italy too, UK too, Germany too, uh, there's been uh, Turkey too, and uh, Russia. Uh, do you think that this is detrimental and uh, to, to any solution to the Libyan crisis? Okay, regarding the Cairo talks. The Cairo talks uh, have, have, uh, have been a long process. I think they finished six sessions now and we're entering the seventh. There are already some preliminary things even this week. Uh, this process was uh, started, uh, and I don't think this is, maybe it's never been made public, but, but it's, uh, you can check with the, with the um, Colonel uh, Salim Juha, who was my military attaché at uh, my embassy in Abu Dhabi. We worked on a basic document on this long ago, and uh, he took that document to Saraj and then to the Egyptians and to various other people. And it was this process was started basically by a by a Misratan military man, uh, Salim Juha. So to say that Misrata is not interested in the unification of the Libyan army is not the case. I I, I know personally uh, not only Salim Juha but Muhammad Haddad. And uh, much of the rank and file of our the most important uh, officers of Misrata want the negotiation with the with the with the rest of the Libyan army. There are certain uh, institutions in Libya that are uniquely national. The army is one uh, because of the uh, Libyan um, the Libyan military college uh, was pan Libyan, and all the officers lived with other officers, were trained with other officers from all over Libya. So the officer class of Libya is actually quite pan-Libyan. They're not, they're not regionally minded. The other institution is the Boy Scouts of Libya, the Girl Scouts of Libya, and the third one is the Libyan Red Crescent. These institutions are pan-Libyan, par excellence. Okay? So I believe that the, the uh, notion that Masratan officers don't want the unification is not true. Now, what are they objecting to in terms of uh, uh, Field Marshal Haftab? Uh, yes, there are concerns about any attempt to monopolize the uh, leadership of the Libyan army. Yes, I, I totally agree that they do have such concerns. But I think that they, from what I know, they are quite open to a, a, a structure of joint command. Okay? The question is how to do it. The officers who are working in the uh, Cairo meetings are actually professional uh, uh, Libyan officers, some of whom are legal officers. Uh, and, and they have done an amazing job to generate uh, structures with checks and balances that can comfort everyone. The last stage of filling in the positions is the hardest stage, but I believe that we're very close, and it is the wrong time to abandon that process. I cannot see how we can make any step forward unless we unify the Libyan army, as, as uh, uh, um, Mr. Sami has uh, just pointed out. I believe that unification of the Libyan army is easier if it is done in a pilot mode first. And what I suggested to, to the leadership of the army in the east and some of the officers from the west is that we test out the unification by making a pan-Libyan election protection force. So we say that we want to create a force of 5,000 people with maybe 150 commanding officers with a joint, uh, a joint command to, to uh, uh, manage that whole process. If you do it for a specific task, so if it's an ad hoc force just for the elections, that could very well develop into the uh, seed of a, of a unified Libyan army. And I think we're very close. I think we should not despair. I have supported the Egyptian process in every interview I made because I truly believe that that's a it's, it's actually very encouraging that the officers from Masrata and Zintan and the East and the, West and the South are all working together. I think the Libyan army officers are closer to unification than the politicians. Okay. Uh, the gentleman at the back. Yes. Well, um, my name is Gianluca Brusco from the Italian Embassy. Um, just a bit. Perhaps I wasn't here uh, when you started your, uh, your... Maybe it's a good thing. I wasn't very flattering. I heard the part when you weren't flattering, but I was uh, curious to hear if you explain why exactly. Uh, my question would be, uh, perhaps I'm wrong, but uh, when a, 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 a very large number of, uh, of actors, both domestic and international, uh, mentioned the reason why 
uh, elections in Libya have not been easy to achieve so far. There are a number of very, very, very concrete facts. Lack of, a, of an election law, lack of a constitution, a security setup that is not shared internally, uh, a security situation polarized, which you have described, and so on and so forth. Uh, so you, 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 you said that there was a sort of conspiracy to, 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 to push this process uh, uh, endlessly. Uh, but uh, in fact, uh, I think nobody, uh, it wasn't Italy sitting in Tobruk and not uh, adopting those, uh, those acts. And uh, uh, those things simply haven't been uh, done within the time frame that was uh, very optimistically, it seems, uh, uh, agreed uh, uh, in Paris. Uh, then later in Palermo, we re, uh, reconvened with a much larger number of actors, and they all stood behind uh, uh, Salame's effort and his action plan, which was uh, endorsed uh, and also changed uh, in a way that uh, to, 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 to build on uh, that would build on, on, on Paris. So I think that uh, it's it's a bit uh, I don't know. It sounds a bit. Uh, uh, you know, your reasoning on uh, on Palermo being a way to to, to postpone uh, elections and just uh, you know it sounds uh, uh, rhetorically uh, uh, you know captivating for a politician, but I just don't understand why you would say that. Uh, on uh, on another issue um, on uh, on the approach on migration, yeah. I would like to rectify. You described as a part of it, which is. Uh, building the uh, capacities uh, of the Libyan Coast Guard, of, Li of the Libyan security forces, uh, as a way for Libya to develop that uh, uh, status as a state that it wants to, and, and uh, rightly wants to, to achieve. Uh, um, but at the same time, I think that that's a, a facet of a much more uh, uh, multifaceted strategy, which is the European strategy, which, as you know, has a domestic an internal dimension, the European uh, strategy on American migration, an external dimension, a part of that external dimension is to do exactly what you said, to work with Africa, with the countries which uh, uh, most of the migrants come from, and to have them build the conditions to, 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 to avoid uh, this uncontrolled uh, migration. As you know, Italy uh, has the finance and keep on fi keeps on financing together with Germany most of the Valletta Trust Fund, which was established by the European Union as a way to support investment and, and, uh, and development in Africa. And we are very, very committed to that as well. So if you, you know, focus just on one aspect, uh, which is an aspect that we need to put in place in order to uh, avoid also a domestic backlash of what is happening uh, in terms of migration. Uh, but it's, a, it's, a, it's clearly uh, not a, a long-term solution, and I agree with you. But by, by single-handedly focusing on that, I think uh, you, 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 know, you give a, a, a bit of a, uh, of, a, of a misleading, if I may say, picture of what we are trying to, to do together with the European Union. Okay. Um, first of all, all, all interpretation is highlighting, as uh, Hans Georg Gadamer says. And when you have a book and you put uh, yellow markers on certain lines, you inevitably neglect the other lines. But maybe the uh, emphasis on certain points will, will bring out exactly the kind of comments uh, Your Excellency uh, General uh, uh, brings out. So it's, it's good that we discuss this. I think I amply explained that, that we need a comprehensive policy and that we need to work on it together and that it's a multinational uh, effort and that it has multi-dimensions and that I talked about the differential and about the economic. But what I have issues with about the approach is not that you're training our Coast Guard. What I have issues is the agreement you signed with Sarraj. The agreement you signed with Sarraj is in violation of Libyan sovereignty. And Sarraj may be a lovely guy to keep and who, who would sign all the papers you would give him. But it's, it's, it's very bad for Libya. It's a bad deal. Uh, I, I revolted against Gaddafi, but the Gaddafi deal of 2008 is a much better deal than the Sarraj deal. And the Sarraj deal was never negotiated properly. It never passed through the elected Libyan gov uh, parliament. It, is, it, is, it was actually challenged in court, and, and Sarraj lost the case in court. 
this is an illegal treaty that was signed and it, it, it actually basically results in a million immigrants staying in Libya rather than going to you. If they go to you, they would be distributed amongst a, 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 a European population that's quite vast. When they stay in Libya, they are one-sixth of the population. So uh, that is why I have objections with it. It is not that you are uh, uh, training the Coast Guard, which was uh, according to the 2008 <coughs> agreement anyway, and for which Libya is, is paying. Now, regarding the contributions, I salute your contribution to the Valletta Fund and what you're doing for development and so on. But when it comes to Libya, I absolutely, as a Libyan, feel insulted each time I see some country bragging about 200,000 euro donation when the interest on our frozen funds is in the billions. OK, so um, uh, that is what I have contentions with. Now, regarding the Palermo uh, Accord. I believe that the French made a huge mistake by not doing enough diplomatic consultation with other countries. I admit this. And I believe that that has to do with the fact that this was done at the presidency level and not through the foreign ministry of France, and maybe more should have been done for outreach and, and having other people on board. However, I believe once we've had dates and once we've had four major stakeholders in Libya agreeing for the first time, everybody should have celebrated this. Everybody should have stood behind this, and everybody should have kept everybody, held everybody accountable for this. Instead, we had everybody making up excuses for not implementing the date. And uh, with all due respect, you have changed your ambassador now. There is the, uh, a new ambassador of Italy. Your ambassador came out on my television channel, spoke for two hours, okay? And during those two hours, managed to give very much the impression that Italy was not for the elections in December of 2018. Now, the ambassador is a friend of mine, and I went to Italy, and we, we, we sorted all this out, and I am sure that was a big misunderstanding. However, I spoke to the foreign ministry in Italy. I went there, we talked about it, and I urged them. I told them, if you want Palermo to succeed, build on Paris. Don't destroy Paris, because Paris gave us a deadline. Okay? And instead, we have this prolongation. Thank God, through the convolutions and the, and the Marshall coming and not coming and all sorts of drama, we have managed to salvage at least the principle that there are elections in Libya, at least with some sort of a rough deadline of, 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 of the spring of 2019. So I did say that there are positive results from Palermo, namely at least that we did not obliterate the elections. Okay? However... I personally know firsthand that there was no enthusiasm in Rome for the, for the uh, results of Paris. And I think that hurt us a lot, because Italy is extremely important. It, Italy is very close. If there was an Italian endorsement of the, of the dates of Paris, it would have been a very different situation. Now, regarding the constitutional <coughs> framework, because sometimes people argue for things that make absolute sense and sound rhetorically, rhetorically convincing, as your, uh, as your Excellency mentioned. However, the, the core is wrong. One of the main arguments that is used is that we have been through too much transition, eight years of transition. We need a permanent state, and only a, a constitution can give us a permanent basis for the government. And elections must be based on the constitution. Sounds elegant, okay? But you fail to see the following that this constitutional draft has issues and objections from the so-called indigenous populations of the Tabu, the Tuareg, and the Amazigh, and violates, therefore, UN standards on, on the rights of the original peoples of the, of the country. Secondly, that it has some weird provisions about, uh, 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 about Sharia that actually make it indistinguishable from the constitution that, that the, the Khalifa of, of ISIS wanted to implement. Thirdly, it has serious issues for the people of the east of Libya who feel that it's a centralized constitution that will oppress them. And fourthly, which is a point that is hardly ever discussed, is that the members of the esteemed committee got paid 600,000 dinars each, according to the audit report of the control ministry, two weeks before they approved the draft. So what I'm trying to say, it's not exactly a consensus constitution. Okay? Mind you, the parliament said, OK, we still have to go to the referendum. And they just passed the referendum law. But because the Islamists in Tripoli who control the state council don't like it, they have just object objected to the decrees of the parliament. 
even though it says in the Sekhirat Accord that they're supposed to be advisory and not legislative. They've made themselves into a second chamber with the blessings of, and support of some Western countries. And now we have this impasse again. So bear in mind, Libya for 42 years was run on the basis of a constitutional decree in 1970. And it has been run for eight years on a constitutional decree of 2011 that is now has just undergone its 11th amendment. Okay? Constitutional framework does not mean necessarily constitution. Even the Sekhirat Accord itself has enough provisions to be a constitutional framework. Okay? So there is a decree number five for the year in 2014 based on the recommendations of the February committee that actually shows you how you can have a presidential election, how you can have a parliamentarian election, does a separation of powers, explains what the powers of the presidency is, explains what the checks and balances are, explains how oversight works. We have enough basis for elections. The only reason we're not having elections is because they're not in the vested interest of the ruling class that is now ruling us, and is not in the vested interest of countries who are benefiting from having free signatures from the Sarraj government. And that is, that is a real issue. And I asked the Italian government through the foreign ministry to mind Italy's strategic long-term interest in Libya to make sure that you serve the interests of the Italian people and the Libyan people and not to use the expediency of a docile government that is signing anything you give it because that will backfire on you in the future. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Uh, for your talk. Uh, I'm Nasser Salman, I'm a lawyer from Libya. Uh, my field is law and foreign direct investment, uh, also my PhD about uh, the legal protection of FBI in Libya. Because that my question would be about uh, the Libyan Investment Authority. Uh, um, I'm sure that you hear that about, uh, you hear the news about uh, the frozen money belong for the Libyan Investment Authority and the last, man, uh, the last two months in Belgium and other countries. Yeah. So uh, the question is, what's your idea about that? And the second question, how can we protect the first money, uh, especially that there is a big corruption in Libya nowadays, and there are a lot of our different countries like uh, UK or uh, Belgium or Luxembourg that are talking about how we can use that money for uh, different issues. So thank you. <coughs> The reason our frozen funds are in danger is because of our divisiveness. If there is a unified uh, government of Libya that is duly elected and mandated directly by the Libyan people, there would be sufficient unity for it to be able to protect these funds. Unfortunately, several countries have had the habit of jumping over our assets using the excuse of the fight between the two Libyas. So that whenever somebody in the East and the West fights, the only beneficiary is the country that happens to be holding the funds. This has happened and has directly caused us the loss of licenses, telco licenses in some African countries. We have lost certain properties in Africa because of this, this, this fighting. Even in this country, the fight over the LIA has led to judicial oversight over certain assets of, of Libya. So the best way to, to unify, uh, to, to protect our assets is to be united. Unfortunately, too much quarreling, too much personal interest, and the only loser is, uh, are, are the Libyan people. And uh, I cannot see how this will stop until you have proper government. What I, what I would like people to notice and is to be very careful of deals that they do right now, because all sorts of deals are being made and all sorts of contracts are being signed. I believe that because the Sarraj government has never gotten the confidence of the parliament, there is real legal, and you're a lawyer, I'm ignorant of law, you, you, uh, uh, there, there is real, real, real legal ground for suing anybody who has signed deals with the Sarraj government for, uh, for anything. And, and uh, unless you have a clear basis for contract, you should not be doing those contracts. Unfortunately, people have seen this as an opportunity. So they cut deals left, right, and center. People sell and buy and do concessions. Who is Sarraj? Sarraj tried to form a government twice, and the parliament said no, twice. According to the rules of the parliament, that precludes him from forming a third government. But somehow the United Nations says that they believe in the legitimacy of the Libyan parliament, and this is enshrined in the LPA. And at the same time, they recognize the Sarraj government, which is not recognized by the recognized parliament. And then people say, 
Why are you Libyans so divisive? Why can't you unite? Why, why are you splitting your country? You're splitting our country by having this double recognition. Either you say, the hell with the, with the, with the parliament, we, we recognize Sarraj, or you do the opposite. Okay? You so recognize the parliament and say you choose your government. But to say, I recognize Sarraj and I recognize you, but you don't recognize Sarraj, but that's okay, is, is, is a formula for dividing the country, which happens to be very convenient. I am not a believer in conspiracy theories, but this is resulting in what looks like a conspiracy against the, 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 the unity of Libya. Okay? So, um, to go back to, to the Libyan Investment Authority, everyone who has assets of the Libyan Investment Authority should act with morality now and protect these assets. The Libyan state, once it becomes strong again, I am sure will sue everyone who has touched a penny of the Libyan people, be they Libyans or non-Libyans. Libyan mafia has to be put in jail, but so does Maltese mafia, and so does Italian mafia and Turkish mafia. And they're actually, despite their divisiveness, they're quite united in ripping us off. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jamie Prentice. Uh, I'm a reporter at the London Bureau for National UAE, and I uh, used to work uh, for Sami as well at the Libya Herald. Um, I fully uh, take what you say about the ineffectiveness of, of the Siraj government, the lack of transparency uh, within the central bank, uh, and, and it's kind of briefly been mentioned at different parts today, but do you not also think that the Parliament, the, ha the House of Representatives, uh, has completely failed to do its duty as well. Uh, Aguila Sala has been sanctioned by the EU. Your friend Dr. Salami has... I was very impressed, actually, some of the statements he's recently made uh, against the House of Representatives, accusing him of protecting their interests. You know, you have days when there might only be 20, 30, 40 people turning up to vote. Do you not think that they bear uh, a massive responsibility uh, in with this as well? Okay, let me put this quite bluntly. The Central Bank of Libya now, with its current governor, because of the ability to open LCs and to give uh, differential and preferential uh, rates on foreign currency, has an almost infinite ability to bribe. Okay? I will not accuse anyone in particular by name, but a good chunk of the House of Representatives has been duly bribed by the uh, Central Bank of Libya. And uh, this fact has led to the corrosion of the House of Representatives. And uh, not only are uh, some members bribed, but they are directly complicit in keeping us in the state of affairs that we are in. To actually be voted in by the Libyan people and, and not show up at the, at the parliament, and to actually waltz around the world uh, using the funds of the Libyan people and, and not even hold the sessions is an absolute scandal. I, am, I, I predict that if the Libyan people do not get to vote their new leadership, say, by the summer, I would not be surprised if, if, if there is an absolute revolt, not only against Sarraj, but against the HOR and, and everybody else, because this is nonsense. Everything Salama said about the parliament in the United Nations, I completely agree with and I believe is absolutely true. And I think that they bear a direct responsibility. They have been irresponsible. They have not delivered elections laws. And if they think they can linger forever, then they underestimate the anger of the Libyan people. The Libyan people, I was told in 2010 and 2009, will never revolt against Gaddafi. And they saw the revolt. And when the revolt came, it was so massive and so irrational in many ways. Okay? It unleashed forces that we're still suffering from right now. I truly believe that we are basically with the kind of adamance and impunity of the, of the ruling class right now, we are heading towards another revolution, I would predict, not later than September of 2019. And uh, I, I know it's dangerous to make deadlines, but I think I, I can feel it. Because if you have a child who's dying of cancer and you can't take them to a proper hospital, and if you lose a baby because they, you don't have a proper incubator for a premature baby, and, 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 and uh, if, if, if women cannot even get their, their basic needs met in hospitals, if, if old ladies are dying because uh, they, they cannot get proper uh, care, something is going to give, you know? And I, I think that the, the callousness of the ruling class has just been absolutely uh, disgusting. And what's weird is that whenever we want to have a dialogue against, about the next session, is we conv convene the same people, you know? Mm -hmm. 
the people who 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 are really out there in the in the in the real life are not being convened and they have no voice. Uh, our television channel has a program called Maltini. We try to go and talk to them village by village, and you should listen to what they say. You know, and if you actually listen to, we have over over 600 uh, uh, episodes of, of people giving testimony to their situation. And it's actually quite sickening. It, it makes me lose sleep. You know, I don't know how these people who are governing can sleep. Well, thank you. I'm afraid we have reached <coughs> the end of the session. And I was quite grateful to you, Dr. Nayad, for actually ending uh, talking about the human dimension, because sometimes we get stuck in this geopolitical and strategic uh, discussions and we forget about the people and the challenges they have to face in their everyday life. Of course, a lot of challenges ahead. Uh, we wish you and Lydia uh, all, the, all the very best. Thank you very much for the wide-ranging and very passionate discussion, and thank you all for your, uh, your comments and your intervention. Uh, before we leave, please join me in thanking Dr. Nayad.